Welcome. In this video, I'm going to get us started by talking about the first couple of chapters in our textbook, and I want to talk about the difference between the internet and how the internet works and the World Wide Web, because those are very different things and they mean different things, and I want to clear that distinction up nice and early. So the internet is a large collection of computers or a collection of storage or servers. This is where the information is housed and resides, and it's been around for a while. We've had computers for quite some time. They've been storing information, they just weren't networked together. But the web, however, is a rather new item. This is like thinking of a layer that sits on top of the internet and it allows you to access the information that's inside. If we wanted to gather information on our own personal computers and our own personal server, we would just go to our computer and get our information back. But let's say we're in Utah and we're writing a paper on the phases of the moon. And we know there's a nice study that was done in England, but we can't get to that information on our side because it's on their servers, unless we have a way to get to it. Now this was a real problem when trying to collaborate between different laboratories and scientists and universities in the past. All that information was spread out all across the world and there was no way to access each other's information. I mean, even if they wanted to share it, they didn't have a way to. So Sir Tim Berners-Lee and a group of other people uh, working at CERN, which is a laboratory in Switzerland, they wanted a way to try and fix this. So Sir Lee, who's credited with being like the quote unquote father of the internet, had this idea that if there were these hypertext links or ways that he could facilitate the sharing, essentially the information that is stored on their local server and on the local server of others could be connected through an HTTP client to, a, to the internet to get the information delivered in real time. There wasn't going to be any more waiting on phone calls or snail mail or hard to read facsimiles, nothing. They were going to be able to get information rather quickly. Now this was back in 1989 and the idea was really kind of developing at that point because it wasn't until 1991 that Sir Lee built the first website um, online and that's really kind of like the beginning of the internet. It is pretty new and infantile in its development if you think about it. 1989 wasn't that long ago. So in the beginning, those pages that, that were served up, they were plain, they were basic. I mean, we're just looking at monochromatic text. And if you wanted to get that information, there won't be any fancy images or fonts or colors or backgrounds, just text. That's what we called Web 1.0, and that was that first iteration of the websites where you were just going to receive the information in the format that was given, and you had no control or no say over that creativity. With Web 2.0, that changed where we were allowed to have some creative control and interactivity with our pages. Think about things like Instagram or Facebook, where you can post to and get information back. Um, you can actually interact with it instead of just having static pages that were delivered to you. So let's go ahead and shift gears just a tiny bit and talk about how it works. So we're typing information into the browser and it's going to the server to get that info back in what appears like real time. We're seeing it happen in a fraction of a second. And let's go back to the phases of the moon paper that we're writing back in Utah. And let's think about what happens when we search the term phases of the moon. Because the browser is going to find a whole bunch of great articles that might match what our search parameters are. And one of them is going to be that study done in England from the university in England. So when we click on the URL, that's where the server says, oh, I see you have this particular IP address you want. And then it's going to kick back over a response to our browser using HTML and CSS and JavaScript and maybe a few others that you've heard of, like maybe jQuery. But for us, for this course, when we say client side or front side, we're talking about getting HTML and CSS. Just a quick point out. Um, when we're talking about front end and client side, take a look at the image on that left hand side. This is our client side and our, and our front end. Those words are kind of interchangeable, but this is the end user's perspective. But when we talk about back end and server side on this right hand side, we're talking about things that are outside of the end user's control or purview. Things like source code, where databases reside, things that are happening with Java or other languages on the back end like PHP. So when you hear the words front end, client side, back end, server side, just know that some of those are interchangeable and keep that in mind as we go through this. Now here's a really great image that I love from the book that helps to break this down just a little bit further. Let's say we're on the end user side where it says browser and we are looking for information about jenskitchensite.com. So we type that into our URL and we click on the link that comes back into our browser. Now that reaches out to using the IP address, it reaches out to the server and looks for a particular file. Now if the server finds the file, 
it's going to kick back a response. If it doesn't, it's going to say, oops, we didn't find what you were looking for. Now, in this case, it does find the index.html file, so it's going to send that file back over to the client side to be reassembled on the browser side. Now, as the page is starting to build, it's scanning through and it notices, oh, it looks like you have an image here that we need to get. So it's going to reach back out to the server and say, ah, oh, there's some additional pieces of information that I'm going to need. I want you to pass that back over to me in the browser and I'll continue to assemble this page. You're seeing all of this happen in just the fraction of a second. It's happening so fast, it doesn't even seem like there's more requests other than just the initial one to get that page to load. That assembly that's happening on the browser side, that's happening with HTML and with CSS. So let's break down the different types of code. We're gonna use an analogy. We're gonna call this the Trinity of Web Development and we're gonna use it as if we're building a house. Now the foundational layer of any house, that structural layer, you're talking about the basement and the walls, the floors, the roof, the things that are structurally required in order to make that house a solid foundation or solid base. That's our HTML. We need to build a solid foundation before we can go any further with our house. But once we have our HTML foundation built, we can start putting on our presentational layer, our, our cascading style sheets, our CSS, this is where we're picking things like the paint color for the walls, or if there's going to be hardwood floors or carpet, um, what the color of the carpet might be, if there's going to be window treatments, that sort of thing. It doesn't change our house's structure, it's just decorating and setting the style different from maybe the house that's next door. The last one is our behavioral JavaScript. Um, this is like a scripting language. This is our interactivity. And if we're keeping with that house analogy, then we're talking about maybe turning our lights off or on, closing or opening our garage door, uh, using a garbage disposal, turning on our ceiling fan. These are cause and effect items that are for our house. Those items are there to serve a purpose if we interact with them but it doesn't change our foundation and it doesn't necessarily change our CSS. It's enhancing or adding extra behavior to our pages and to our house. So I mentioned that JavaScript is a scripting language, but HTML is not a programming language. It's actually what we call a markup language. And that means um, we're describing what we want to have display on our web page, and we use elements as part of the structure that our browser can interpret and display appropriately. So for example, if I wanted to display a paragraph, I would need to use a paragraph element. And we use an opening and a closing paragraph tag surrounding content. In this image, we have an opening paragraph tag, a closing paragraph tag, and in between we have this content, I drink copious amounts of coffee. End to end, that whole thing all together, that's the paragraph element. Now the web page is going to consist of a lot of different HTML elements working together to make up the entire HTML document. And the document has to adhere to very specific format and structure in order for it to work correctly. Let's take a closer look at an HTML tag. So an opening tag is going to have our less than, our character, and our greater than. And then on our closing side, we're going to have that less than a forward slash that's going to indicate this is the end of this particular element, whatever the character is, and then that more than sign to close it out. So there's some really specific elements that we're going to use for HTML structure for our page that have to be there. For example, like the doc type and the HTML, the head, the title, the body, those elements will appear in every single HTML document. And then inside of our body, things are going to change depending on what we want to have display in our browser. We might have headings or paragraphs. We might have images or lists. But we're going to practice writing out some HTML. And don't worry about understanding what all of that means at this particular moment, because we're going to get to that pretty soon. But to write HTML, we need to have an editor. And we're going to use VS Code for all of the demonstrations in this class. It's already installed on all of the Madison College computers, and you can install this at home on your PC, Mac, or Linux by navigating over to code.visualstudio.com forward slash download and then following the download instructions. To get us started, the very first thing that we're going to do, we need a root folder or a starting place. So we're going to create one folder called web development, and we'll put that on our hard drive or on our OneDrive for this particular class. I'll create a new folder, and I'm going to name this web development. 
Once we have that in place, we're going to open up our VS Code text editor and get started. If you don't see the open folder on the left side of your VS Code, then go ahead and select File, Open Workspace from Folder, and select the web development folder that you just created. But because I have open folder showing on my screen, I'm going to go ahead and click Open Folder. And now I can click Add. If you're asked to save your workspace configuration as a file, go ahead and select Save if you plan to use the same settings and the same folder again and again. The next thing that we're going to do is right up next to Web Development, we're going to add a folder. So I'm going to select this folder icon with the plus on it, and I'm going to name this Demos. We'll use this to store all of our practice work. Then I'm going to select the Demos folder or make sure that it's selected, and this time I'm going to add a file. I'll hover over the New File option. This time we'll create a file and a folder at the same time. We're going to type in Week 1 Demo forward slash demo.html. Because we included a forward slash in our name, it's going to create the folder and inside of that folder, the demo.html file. So you should see this folder structure in your Explorer menu with an empty HTML page on that main canvas in the middle. Now it's time to actually write some HTML. I'll have this HTML available for you inside of Blackboard, but you can type if you don't want to copy and paste. All right, before we go any further, I want to make a couple of quick notes. The first one is, you'll notice up in my demo.html file, there's this little dot. That's an indication that I have work that hasn't been saved, and I don't want to have that. I want to make sure that as I'm working, I'm continuously saving my progress. So if something doesn't happen right, if I need to roll back to a certain point, if I make a mistake, if I'm viewing changes inside of my page and it doesn't look like it's rendering properly, I want to make sure I'm using the most up-to-date version of that file. So I'm going to save often so I don't lose anything. Now the other thing I want to mention is right now I'm using what's called the dark theme on my page and I'm going to change it to a light theme because I want to show you that there's different editor views and themes that are available to you. That's a pretty big difference, but if you don't like this and you want to use the dark theme, you can change these back and forth. To do this, navigate to settings and you can select color theme. From here you have a lot of different options to choose from that might fit your style. In this first one, I've selected the Visual Studio default, which is light, but I've also used the Visual Studio dark. Whichever one you decide to use is up to you. The next thing that we're going to do now is we're going to view this HTML in our browser. So for this, we're going to first open up our Chrome browser or an instance of Chrome. And I'll drag my demo.html file into my browser and drop it right into this URL. Then I'll select return and now my page is loaded. I could make some changes on my file, so let's change our main heading, our H1, to say Hello World. Notice that dot's there? We need to save that change before we go any further, so I'll select Save. And now when I go back to my web page, I need to refresh my page, and there's my Hello World. Let's take a look at that URL though. If you notice our file path, our URL, it's not really a web address. That's the file path to the folder where our demo is stored. OK, let's go back to the HTML. Notice how each element that we put in here has an opening and a closing tag. But we're going to see instances of a self-closing or an empty element along the way. Those elements, they don't have closing tags. Instead, they just close themselves. So after our first paragraph, let's check this out by trying one. I'll type in my less than or opening, the letters H, R, and I'll close it out right away with a greater than or more than symbol. This is a horizontal rule or a thematic break. So once I save this, and I view this in the browser now, with a refresh, I now have this horizontal rule going across the page. But notice that I didn't have to have a closing horizontal rule. So let's go ahead and remove that. So a horizontal rule, that's just a line in the browser. And because this element has no content, there's nothing between an opening and a closing tag, it just writes the line to the web page. And we'll see a lot more examples of those coming up in other elements later on. And just as a side note, you might see sometimes that the element is written with a forward slash. This is also an acceptable way to write this in this class. 
If you use self-closing or empty elements with that forward slash, that's fine. Just try to make sure that you are staying consistent in whichever one you choose to use. It'll have a lot of value down the road when you're trying to search out whether you're using a horizontal rule or a horizontal rule with a forward slash. You'll want to make sure that you're being consistent. But either one, very acceptable. I don't like to type any more than I have to, so I've removed that forward slash. Personal choice. But now that we've done that, let's take a look at our page. We just made our very first web page. If you have any questions on any of the material that I just went through, please don't hesitate to ask.